Well, good morning. It's great to be here today before the throne of God and worship, to be able to sing praises and to worship Him. He's got a glorious name, a name that needs to be honored and a name that be, needs to be revered, a name that we should never use in vain. And how grateful that we have His name before us how grateful that we are and blessed we are to be able to serve him each and every day. This song that we have just sung is clearly one of my favorites. The lyrics and the music just seem to be perfect to me and I appreciate it very much. But I am aware that we all have different favorites. Different songs mean different things to each and every one of us and I guess that is okay. We all have songs that might pull tears from our eyes based off of what the words have to say or just based off what they may mean to us and our families. I know my dad's favorite song and I know my mother's favorite song. And every time dad's favorite song, Oh, to be like thee, is led, well, you know where my mind goes back to. My mom's often said that her favorite song is Angry Words, though she's changed it recently. <laughs> I guess she has the right to do that. But every time it is led, I, I remember the angry words she's spoken to me. <laughs> no, not really. But, you know, I think of her. And I know we have the same. You remember the favorite song of your parents or him and Maybe those who have passed on before. Well, this song was written by Horatio Spafford in 1873. And Horatio was a very successful businessman who lived and worked up in Chicago. And one day in the late 1850s, he went to Sunday school. He was 29 years old and he met the love of his life, a young immigrant someone that just came to America from Norway. And they befriended one another and decided after some time they wanted to get married. The problem was, and yes, there was a problem, he was 29 and she was 15. I know that happened some in those days, but it was still considered scandalous. So they met with their families and they decided what he would do, they would do, is he would send her to one of the finest boarding schools, pay for it in Chicago, so she could get an education. And when she turned 18 years old, they would get married. Well, that's exactly what happened. And when she turned 18, they were married and they had four beautiful children with one another. Well, after some time, his wife began to get homesick and they decided that they would take a trip to Norway together so she could be reacquainted with family and with friends and her children could see her homeland and, and so forth. But something happened before they got on the ship and he had to remain in Chicago. He told the family to go ahead and he would catch up with them later. Well, nine days into their journey, their ship in the middle of the Atlantic collided with another and it went down. All four of their children drowned three miles deep in the middle of the Atlantic. And the mother was found clutching on to some type of debris and she was saved. And when she had opportunity, she telegrammed her husband and what she said was, saved alone. What shall I do? Saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio then boarded a vessel and headed straight to Europe. And days later, after he was passing over the wreckage, the captain called him up front and told him this is where his children were buried. And he wrote about that experience to his sister-in-law, and this is what he wrote. He said, on Thursday last, we passed over the spot where she went down. In mid-ocean, in waters three miles deep. But I do not think of our dear ones there. They are safe, folded, the dear lambs. And I know tradition is a little different from here on after, but 
Some traditions state that as they were coming back to America and they crossed over that portion of waters once again, that he stopped and he penned these words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Friends, our pilgrimage is a, I don't know, it's definitely a bag of tricks and that's for sure. Some of us, we live successful lives on planet earth and we never get sick, never go into the hospital till we're 99 and then we just pass on. Others suffer tremendous tragedy I knew a young lady in Tanzania years ago that we converted to Christ, and I've often thought of her. She was 18, 19 years old, and she was a severe epileptic. And I've often thought of her and wondered if only she was in America. You see, their economy is different. They don't have electricity and electric stoves and gas ovens and so forth, and they would cook with open flame. I don't know how many times she would have an epileptic seizure and end up in the flame. Her legs were burnt, they were scarred from these episodes that she had. It's just not right. It's not fair that she was born there in a land where they don't have the ability, the finances, to take care of something like that. Had she been here in America, in Europe, so a lot of things like this happen, it's just not fair. I think of a young boy that we dealt with years ago. I was running a school system then and he needed to be punished. And one of the teachers went and got the punishing mechanism. And I was there and I witnessed it. And as they whipped it out, the kid fell on the ground, curled up in a ball and urinated all over himself. No doubt in my mind, that child was being abused. Life is not always fair. And to that, the writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter nine and verse 11 wrote, I returned and I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, meaning the fastest runner doesn't always win. We've seen that on the Olympics where someone falls or they pull a hamstring or something. Nor to battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. You see, friends, there are variables and there are variables everywhere. And then he went on to say, by time and chance, they happen to them all. So even the testimony of the wise man here declares that life is not always fair. Now, for most of us, life's been good. And we have to admit that. But there are some like the lady that I just mentioned and the young boy that I just mentioned. There are some in lands like Nigeria and today where we know child slavery is still taking place. Where kids are still, still being rounded up and sold into the sex slave and things like that. It's not fair that they were born into situations like that in nations that do not control the population. It's not right or fair, if you will, when people are born with terrible diseases that they're going to have to deal with their, enti their entire lives. We think to ourselves and we say, that's just not right. Well, right or wrong, this is our plot in life. The reality is these are things that we're going to have to deal with. But as God's children... We are taught that no matter what we must face, whatever suffering or trial there is, that we can still sing on planet earth with hope, knowing that it is well with our souls because we have a savior. And we have a father above who loves us more than anything. And he evidenced it by sending his son to die for you. 
This morning, I want us to look at three different names of God from Scripture. Names that describe who He is, what He is, and what He means to me, and what He should mean to you. And through each of these names, I believe we could come forth with an understanding that no matter the trial, no matter the COVID, it can be well with your souls. First, I want us to consider the name that we have a God who sees. He is a God who sees and he's on our side. In Proverbs chapter 15 and in verse 3, the Bible says God's eyes are everywhere. He's keeping watch on the evil and he's keeping watch on the good. In Isaiah chapter 64 and in verse 4, Isaiah wrote that we have a God who works for him, who waits for him. So those of us who are waiting on him, we have a father who's working for you. And he's watching out for you if you are good. Why does this concept of an all-seeing God scare people? I don't understand that. In Psalm 139, we can read an entire chapter about the all-seeing God. And maybe today the concept of an all-seeing God scares people and it may just be parents' fault. Yes, I'm going there. <laughs> How many times have we as parents, when our child did something wrong, we remind them, God saw that. They said something wrong, we remind them, God heard that. As if God is some big old whipping machine up in the heaven ready to paddle at any instant they do something wrong. But the Bible teaches us that the concept that God sees all is a blessing to his children. And if we are faithful in the Lord, there is no reason for us to ever be scared that God is watching. In Genesis chapter 16, if you have your Bibles, Genesis 16. And verses 7 through 14. We have here a terrible situation that Hagar had to deal with. If you remember, God told Abraham and Sarah that they would have children, but Sarah was barren and could not. Year after year, there was no child, but God still promised. And Sarah one day had a bright idea. She's like, well, why don't you take my handmaid and you bear a child with her? She can be a surrogate, if you will. Well, instead of waiting on God to fulfill his promises and waiting on God to do what God said he would do, they decided to try to help God. God doesn't need help, my friends. But whatever the case, Hagar, she was a handmaid. And the word handmaid is just a fancy little word that means slave. She was a slave that worked in the home. She may have had more freedoms than other slaves, but the reality is this was a slave. And a slave has no right of refusal in situations like this. And now this young slave girl is being thrust in the middle of this mighty and rich family. And she bears a child. And now the most powerful woman in this village, in this tribe, in this group, is jealous of her. And Sarah goes to Abraham in chapter 16 and in verse 5, and she pleads her case to Abraham. And notice what Abraham told Sarah in verse 6. He said, in essence, she is yours. You just do with her whatever you want to do. She's your slave. She's your problem. Whatever you do is fine with me. Sarah was mad. Sarah was envious. Her envy turned to jealousy. It turned to malice and so much more. And she was treating Hagar like dirt. And Hagar finally had enough. And she took her own life in her own hands. Being a runaway slave meant if she got caught, she could be put to death. And she took off into the wilderness to flee away from this pathetic situation that she found herself in. 
She was thirsty. She was hungry. She collapsed. Guess who was watching? Guess who was watching? And though her situation may not have been right, and though it was unfair, the reality is for those who wait on the Lord, brethren, there is hope. Because God's eyes are everywhere upon the just. So God sent the angel of the Lord running to Hagar, found her in the wilderness. And he told her in chapter 16 and verse 9 to return and submit. And if she would return and submit, if she did, number one, all would be well. But number two, her child would grow up and become a father of a great nation himself one day. Well, that meant Sarah wouldn't kill her. <laughs> That meant Sarah wouldn't kill the child. That meant God would be with her. And God would take care of her and him. Well, after the angel prophesied about these things, the Bible says in verse 17, notice this. Then she called the name of the Lord that spoke to her. You are the God who sees. El Roi. The God who sees. Friends, we have a God who sees. He saw this slave and her condition. Her life was unfair and God saw. She was owned and God saw. She was told to go lay with someone and bear a child with them and God saw. She was being tormented by Abraham's wife. And God saw. Friends, no matter the conflict, no matter the situation, if we are his children and we are waiting on him, God sees. And with that knowledge, we can know it can be well with your soul. Secondly, we can know today that it can be well with your souls because not only do we have a God who sees, but we have a God who provides. We have a God who provides Genesis chapter 22. This name or this title in reference to God is used for the very first time in scripture in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 14. Genesis chapter 22, God was testing Abraham. God had promised Abraham and Sarah a child and God rolled back their years and he cured her barrenness and they had a child. Oh, Abraham loved Isaac. Isaac was his life. My children are not here today. They're worshiping at Smithfield. I love them both. One's the pride of my life and the other's the apple of my heart. My daughter's precious. If you talk to her, you understand she has some conditions. She loves her dad and dad loves her. She's going to have a hard life. I don't know what's going to happen with her. I don't know where we're going to be. But I do know this. God tests us. God was testing Abraham. He took his only son, as the Bible calls him here, builds an altar, binds his son, Lays him up there. Draws a knife. You see, God has to know. Do we love him more than we love father or mother? Do we love him more than we love the apple of our eyes, the pride of our lives? Do we love him? Because if we don't love him more, we're not worthy of him. Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 32. Well, if scholars are right, God was testing his allegiance. God was testing his faith. Who does he love more? Take your son, your only son, whom you love. Go into the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. Chapter 22 and verse 2. As far as this command was concerned, it was black and white. There's no gray here. Either you do it. Or you lose. 
Either you obey or you disobey. Abraham's faith, my friends, was simply obeying. He knows to those who wait on the Lord, God is looking out for those who are good. He remembered the promises of God and he knew by faith, Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 19, that if he offered that child, God would raise him up from the dead because God said, I'm going to make a great nation through that child. He pulled the knife in verse 12. Don't lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, the angel of God said. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Though he did not kill his son, intentionally he did. He wasn't going to stop. He was going to thrust the knife. And then in verse 13, the Bible says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and saw that behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Abraham went and he took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And then notice verse 14. Abraham called the name of the place God will provide. God will provide. Isn't that great that God provided a substitute for Abraham? It just so happened that God made sure that there was a ram there ready to be slain. And the point is, as with Hagar, trials and temptations are here. We're going to have to deal with them. Troubles are at every hand. But for those who seek his face, those who wait on the Lord, oh, we have a God, my friends. Who in his time, may not be our time, but in his time, he will provide. Thirdly, Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. We have a God who heals. A God who heals. I cannot imagine losing a child. And anyone who has, I... I don't know how you coped with it. I can't imagine how Horatio and his wife dealt with losing four precious babies at the same time. You know, Charles Darwin, we've heard of him, the father of atheism or evolution, all that nonsense. You know what turned him into an atheist, don't you? His six-year-old daughter died. He couldn't handle it. He had to blame somebody. And guess who he blamed? He blamed God. I don't understand what that telegram did to Horatio when his wife said, Saved alone, what shall I do? In Exodus chapter 15 and verses 22 and following, we read about the children of Israel. They had just walked across dry land with walls of water around them. They crossed to the other side of the land and the walls came down upon the Egyptian army and they drowned. God delivered them. Oh, they were excited. Moses' sister, Miriam, she started dancing and she started playing the castanets and she started singing in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 21. She said, sing to God for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has been thrown into the sea. The reality is three million people were just delivered, give or take a few. And they were on their way to God's mountain to Sinai. Three days into the journey, they were thirsty. <laughs> Some of us can't go 30 minutes without a Dr. Pepper and you're waiting for the preacher to shut up so you can crack yourself open a good old Texas Dr. Pepper. I don't blame you, I would too, but they're not really healthy for you, by the way. <laughs> Imagine going three days without water with your friends and families. It is kind of life-sustaining liquid or so I've heard. 
And they finally get to the waters of Mara. And then you can see the kids running down there with their buckets or jars or whatever it is to get water for themselves and for their family. And they get there and the water is what? It's yucky. It's bitter. It's unhealthy. Israel began to cry and they cried out to God and God showed Moses a tree, a stick, a limb. And he said, you throw this into the waters and they will be purified. And then we read in verse 25 that God was testing Israel as he had just tested Abraham. And in verse 26, then we see the God who sees and the God who provides. He becomes the God who heals and he told those children on that day that they were being tested. They were going to go through a lot of testings in the wilderness throughout their 40 years. Some they would overcome, some they would fall flat on their face. But whatever the case, as we see in verse 26, so long as we set our sights on the Lord, we look toward him, put our faith and our trust in him. Friends, we have a God who provides healing. O oh, wretched man that I am who can deliver me from this bondage of death. We have a God who heals. Oh, there is no righteous, no, not one, Paul wrote in Romans 3 and verse 10. But we have a God who heals. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we have a God who, sit, who heals. The wages, your payment of sin is death, but oh no, not in Christ. Because you, my friends, have a God who heals. Friends, I don't know what may be plaguing you individually. This, these are some weird times. I've been coming here now, I guess, on and off since January. Well, you know, for years, but you know, January. <laughs> I really haven't got the opportunity to know any of you. Haven't had the opportunity to visit you in your home. Go out to eat. Normally we would go straight out to the buffet. Man, I saw they closed the buffet down the road. That's a reason to cry unto the Lord, isn't it? Normally we would do those things, right? It's been a different time. God will heal and we know it and we have faith and we're waiting. So though I may not know what plagues you, what burdens you, the reality is I do know there is a solution. I do know, my friends, that yes, we have plagues, but I do know as well they're not God's fault. God didn't single you out and say, I'm going to get you. Sin has disrupted this world. It's disrupted nature. It's disrupted our genetics. It's disrupted everything. Sin is God, not God's fault. It's Satan's fault. But my friends, there is a solution to the sin problem. There is a solution to the death problem. And God is fair. And if we set our focus and sights on the cross during our trials, then guess what? The most high God who has unrestrained power like none other, he sees your pain and he will provide easement. He will work to heal. And once we realize that he is the solution to all of our soul's diseases, then, friends, we can cast our cares upon him. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever the cost, whatever the lot, it, my friends, can be well with your soul. We have a God who sees, a God who provides, and a God who heals. Friends, if you need the prayers of the church this morning, we're here to take part in that. To uplift your name and your struggles before the Lord to help you who will, can help you like none other. But also, as I've noted in this short lesson, we all have a sin struggle and a death struggle. 
But God has demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In eternity, he sent the lamb, or planned to send the Lamb of God from the foundations of the world to be slain for you. And though we have other struggles, the sin and the death are our largest. And he has come to heal you, to provide salvation. And if you're here this morning, you have not been baptized into Christ. Why would you leave here sick spiritually? Let your faith work. Confess his name. Repent of your sins and be baptized into the wonderful blood of Christ where you will arise a new creature, a child of God, royalty, and priest of Him. Sounds like a good plan. Come now as we stand and sing.